Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. A.D. Ray. Dr. Ray is an NIH-funded neuroscientist who has been studying cannabis, opioids, and their interaction for her entire career. She has a strong publication record in chronic pain, addiction, and harm reduction. Dr. Ray is currently an assistant scientist at Legacy Research Institute in Portland, Oregon, and holds a joint faculty appointment at Washington State University. Her multifaceted work ranges from synaptic physiology to clinical pain management. Dr. Ray's long-term academic research goal is to define the harm reduction potential of cannabis in the opioid overdose epidemic. As a co-founder of Smart Cannabis, AD leverages her knowledge of pharmacology to enhance consumer well-being and support craft cannabis producers. Smart Cannabis is a Portland-based consulting and research firm that empirically identifies the world's most enjoyable cannabis. Now on to the show. Hi, AD. Thanks for coming on the show today. You bet. Thank you so much for having me, Todd. Yeah, well, I had such a great time meeting Steph finally in person uh, down at Photo X, and uh, she said you'd be the best one to talk to on the show. So let's just dive right in. Can you give me a, a brief background on your research and how you got to, well, the place that you are today? You bet. So, you know, I've been studying cannabis and cannabinoids my entire adult life. I wrote my first grant to study cannabinoids in the laboratory in 2004. And my hypothesis in my academic work is that we can use cannabis and cannabinoids to reduce our reliance upon prescription opioid drugs for pain relief. So I've studied this problem from a number of different angles, you know, all the way zoomed way in down to how the neurons in the brain function in the presence of these drugs, um, all the way out to, you know, now we're clinically managing people's pain using cannabis. Um, so and, and a lot of other things in between. So where where I sit right now, I still have a very, you know, large or, or not large, I guess, but I, I have a very active academic um, research program. But as you're aware, the federal constraints for studying cannabis are pretty tight. So we, we have to get creative in how we're um, answering some of the most burning questions that we have about cannabis and its effects in people. So uh, one, of the, one of the projects that I'm the most excited about in pretty much all of my life is um, this, the work that I do outside of academia uh, with our company, Smart Cannabis. And um, really, the, the, the cool thing about this project is that we get to answer some really fundamental questions about what does cannabis do in human beings, healthy human beings. Um, and the way that we've structured it, we can answer these really um, exciting questions uh, in a way that doesn't violate um, any laws and doesn't get us in trouble. So, um, you know, a, a lot of academic researchers in the cannabis field have had to get very creative in how they do their work in order to answer the kinds of questions they're interested in. So, for instance, uh, I have a colleague at Washington State University, Carrie Cutler, and um, she does um, essentially psychometric testing. She gives people, you know, computer tests to do over Zoom because that way she can have this person do a dab over Zoom instead of illegally doing a dab inside her laboratory. So this is this is what I mean with being creative and and how we're answering these really interesting questions. So so yeah, at the moment, you know, I've built my academic work up you know, over the years, NIH grant by NIH grant. And, um, and now I do sort of tandem projects, both inside and outside of academia. So what drew you to cannabis in the first place? This is more just a, out of personal curiosity. It sounds like uh, a lot of your focus initially was on the medical side, but now you're looking at sort of its effects, uh, both medically and recreationally. Is that, is that right? That's pretty fair. Yeah. And I would say that my draw initially, like really, really early in my career as, as an undergrad was pure scientific curiosity. You know, I, I was looking at these two drugs, opioids and cannabinoids, both of which were used as pain relievers. And I knew that if you use two drugs together at the same time, often they amplify one another's effects. And that was true and continues to be true for, for both of these drugs. Um, 
But, you know, I came into it as a skeptic. You know, I was a straight edge, hardcore punk rock kid. And I was like super anti drugs and alcohol. And I, I was really interested in addiction. And it wasn't until I saw all the literature for myself and produced some of that evidence myself that was like, huh, there's really something here. And, you know, sure enough, you keep following the evidence over, you know, decades. And it's a very compelling story that this is, this is clearly a safer drug compared to opioids when it comes to pain relief. And, and even, you know, if we're talking about from a pure, you know, altered state of consciousness perspective, altering your consciousness with cannabis is arguably more safe than doing so with alcohol. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I, over the years, I, I came to follow the evidence to understand both the therapeutic value and the harm reduction value that cannabis poses. Um, and, and so that's where, that's where I sit now. I'm, I'm looking at the relative safety of cannabis compared to other things that we put into our body, both for a therapeutic purpose and, and for a purely personal reasons. Um, and it, it really is true that this is a, a relatively safe, innocuous substance that, um, that most healthy adults can use for a variety of things. And, you know, the, the way that you ask the question kind of pits medical use against um, adult use uh, as a, a binary choice. But really, I do see this as a spectrum and uh, one individual can fall anywhere on that spectrum, even multiple times a day, they can fall in different places on that spectrum. So, you know, the, the ability of this plant to produce such wide, um, different kinds of chemistry matches up with the ability of the human to use many different kinds of plants for many different kinds of purposes. So yeah, I, 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 do, I do very much see it as a spectrum, and that's kind of where all of my work is, is based on now. Yeah, I think that's a really good point you brought up. Um, it's really the legislation that has created this medical versus recreational sort of binary path when, when you're right. There are all these outcomes and effects that uh, people experience with cannabis that, that it's not really accurate to, to split it so, <laughs> so black and white. And yeah. Um, I think it's funny that, even, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that's even been recently reflected in the scientific literature. You know, we've seen that if you go into a dispensary in Colorado, a recreational dispensary, and you ask people why they're there, 60 or 70 percent of them will say either I'm here to get something to help me sleep or relieve my pain. And that's in the adult use market. So, you know, like it's it, we see it also played out in Oregon where, you know, for a long time, we had the uh, OMMP, the, um, the medical marijuana program, um, and the numbers of, you know, participants in that program have been dwindling over the years. And it's not that those patients are going anywhere. They're just not using the medical program anymore. So that, that's the other thing about cannabis is that it is a very self-empowering tool. So, you know, and, and we, we tend to find that with any kind of patient, when they feel like they are responsible responsible for, or at least they're, they're in control of their own health, um, that, that tends to be a good thing. Uh, so the ability of people to, you know, take this medical tool into their own hands and use it um, to the degree that suits them, you know, that's kind of a win-win. You have empowerment and you have a personalized approach to medicine. Yeah. Now we're kind of on opposite sides of the industry. I think it's really interesting because I came to cannabis sort of like you did in the sense that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a big user. I had never even tried cannabis till I was 33, I think for the first time. And I was, I was so afraid. I, <laughs> I went hiking in the woods and took one little puff and I, I didn't know what, uh, what sort of experiences I would have. Um, cause I was just, I was a control freak and I didn't like the idea of, of this, but, um, I think it's interesting that like Michael Pollan highlights the, uh, the fact that we all, every society, every culture, um, human culture attempts to alter their consciousness in one way or another through the use of plant-based medicines and, and plants. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. But um, the thing that interests me most, most about your research from a personal level is that I have, I find that I have very different effects with cannabis than a lot of my friends and other people in the industry, which is one of the reasons my focus has always been on like cultivation and providing, you know, safe, clean, flower that that to me is the most interesting aspect of it but at the same time like 
I know these effects are so important. And like for me with effects, I, uh, I would, if I smoke most flowers, I will get, um, I'll get sleepy, but I won't fail to fall asleep. My brain will just race a million miles an hour and then I'll just eat everything in sight. And I seem to have that effect across a variety of different cultivars to where, um, it's not as appealing to me as, you know, maybe, um, other, other things like, uh, like you mentioned alcohol, which I agree is way worse than, than cannabis in most cases. But I know that everyone has different sort of effects when they consume cannabis. And this is sort of one of the things that you guys are, are discovering and researching. Can you start to share a little bit about some of that research? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be delighted to. Um, but first, I want to recognize, you know, like, thank you for sharing your story. I think that it is extremely common amongst people and very frustrating. Um, so, you know, I, I and exactly our process through the Cultivation Classic is designed to support exactly this thing that you're describing, which is that engaging with cannabis is a risky behavior. And, and what I mean by that is that you are taking a gamble. You don't necessarily know what's going to happen. You know, you can follow your bud tender's recommendations and you can go based on your previous experiences, or maybe you have a friend who's, you know, well-versed in things. Um, but when you're making a buying decision at the dispensary counter, for the most part, you are not really guaranteed whatever kind of experience, you know, um, you think you want. Uh, so, so that's exactly what our process is designed to support. We want to make it a less, you know, uh, less of a gamble, you know, maximum enjoyment at minimum risk. And so, you know, the, the wonderful thing about the Cultivation Classic is that, you know, not only are we really focusing on organic, like regenerative kinds of flower, um, which we know is best practice, right? We, the cannabis industry isn't going to exist 20 years from now if we burn out the planet or if we burn out the people who are using the plant. So, you know, that's why, you know, this, this particular cup has always been focused on, um, you know, uh, plants that don't use salt and mineral fertilizers that, you know, and we really reward cultivators who are, you know, minimizing their carbon footprint and producing sustainable cannabis. Um, so in Oregon, what, what the competition looks like is that, you know, we accept entries from throughout the state. Um, last year, we had roughly 50 uh, cultivators and a total of 150 flowers, um, which we then put through a very rigorous um, analytical chemistry panel. So we, you know, use one laboratory, the best laboratory we can find. Um, last year, it was Cascadia, who unfortunately is no longer in the Oregon market, but they're doing great work in California. Um, so we've got a nice list of all the cannabinoids and all the terpenes. Then we take that flower and we distribute it to our consumer ambassadors, our judges. And we do this in a double blind, randomized fashion. So what that means is that I don't know what flowers my judges are getting, and they don't know what flowers they're getting either. They're just in, you know, jars with a four-digit number. Um, the next level of that process is that, first of all, they take a tolerance break, 48 hours, before they start engaging with the plants in their kit. Our judges get about 10 flowers per kit, and um, they've got 30 days to, to use them. Now, that is really important, and that's what, you know, that this is a key distinguishing factor from other kinds of cups. You know, it's kind of widely known that other, you know, competitions, if you want to call them that, um, you know, there's a bunch of flowers that get consumed around a conference table, and it's not exactly an objective evaluation of which flower was the best. Um, so this is an extremely rigorous process. We want to make sure that our judges have the time to mindfully complete an assessment of the flowers that are in their kit. So, you know, we give them a, a nice long period of time to do so. And so at the end of that, what we've got is a very valuable data set in that we've got high fidelity plan information, double blinded assessment, and specifically the feedback tool that we've designed, um, you know, that our, our judges log in to our tool and, and they provide their answers to, you know, a survey digitally. And we can really delve into questions, not just like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much did you like this? But was the experience desirable? Was the aroma desirable? You know, what are your tasting notes? 
How did it make your body and your emotions and your cognition feel? We delve into all of those deeper questions so that we can really get a, a more granular idea of exactly what effects these kinds of flowers had in healthy human beings. So, you know, this is th this kind of process takes a lot of effort and time. And I think that that's, you know, that kind of investment is uncommon in, in a lot of those other events that are out there. Yeah, so I just I want to start off by saying I've, I've been to the Cultivation Classic uh, twice now, maybe three times. It's been wonderful. Uh, I love what you guys are doing there. I want to get more involved with it personally. I've been talking with Steph about that, hopefully for next year. Um, but I, it's a great program um, and a great cup. And I do think you are doing uh, the best you can at sort of controlling as many variables as possible. One, one question I had around that, though, was do you have any recommendations for people consuming at the same time of day or same day of the week? Or like, you know, I assume people would have a different effect if they had just, you know, won the lottery and then smoked one of the flowers versus if they had just broken up with their girlfriend and smoked one of the flowers, you know? So is there any way to account for those sorts of fluctuations as well? Or is it just, it's a little too hard to control? I, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, those are, those are excellent questions. And as a bench scientist, those are all the exact kinds of variables I would love to be able to control. But I have learned that this is the reality we live in. People consume at different times of day. They, they consume for different purposes. They have different kinds of, um, you know, uh, schedules. They have different routines. And that is going to be the case no matter how small or how large, you know, the, the cannabis industry is or, or our sample size is. So what we want is to capture naturalistic behavior. So, you know, there, there, we do ask a few things to try and standardize, you know, to the best of our ability. So we have some important questions, you know, when our judges first uh, register to, to try and level the playing field a bit. But in general, you know, like there, it is a, a fact that people's experiences and routines are different, their expectations are different, and we have to capture the reality out there in the world. So yeah, I, I do agree that under ideal laboratory kinds of conditions, we might have, you know, smaller noise in the data and we might be able to detect patterns a little bit more easily if that noise is less prevalent. Um, but in general, you know, we, we have to, we have to live in reality. Sure. And I think just to be clear, this isn't a problem that just exists in measuring, uh, the effects of cannabis. This exists across all health research or anything involving a human subject where you can't put them in a vacuum and expect and, and test. So, uh, that's why you just, it's a, it's a matter of collecting so much data that you have, uh, you know, a good standard deviation. You can create a good mean effect and then uh throw out all that data that you know all that noise that you mentioned that's just uh skews things so you can you can get nice graphs down the time uh, over time if you collect enough information i guess is what i would say around that that is exactly right that's exactly right so let's talk about some of your findings uh this i thought this was really interesting um do you want to start talking about THC in general, or would you like to cover some of the findings more specifically? Do you want to talk about this whole indica versus sativa thing? I know there's a lot we could we could start off with. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. Let's let's start off with what I think is probably the most impactful finding that we came across last year was that, you know, so so when we're um, assessing, we're we're digging through all the data that we get at the end of our you know data collection period. And we can make a composite, you know, sort of enjoyment uh, score, essentially. And, you know, if we, if we look at how enjoyable a flower is, and then we rank them all from the most desirable, you know, all the way down to 150th place least desirable, and zoom in on the top 10. So the top 10 most enjoyable flowers in Oregon. What we notice immediately is that only three of those 10 had more than 20% THC. So that tells us that when you take the, you know, the label off of a jar and you just give a human an ability, an opportunity to enjoy the flower, 
they tend to report that they like the moderate potency flowers the best. I think even our number four or number six best performing flower only had 6% THC. So, you know, this, this is incredibly important because it highlights the legacy of prohibition, namely potency. So right now, uh, you know, from the retail intake manager to the consumer to the producer, there is this like perpetuation of potency as the number one value in cannabis. You know, and, and I don't I don't blame people for, for chasing this because historically it's the only information that we had that, you know, quote unquote, the dank was always related directly to THC potency. But what this data shows us is that enjoyment and intoxication are different. So, you know, we, we know that THC potency is correlated with intoxication for sure. That's been demonstrated in the lab. It's common knowledge. You know, you can go home yourself and do an experiment on yourself and know that more potent flowers mean more intoxication. However, more intoxication doesn't necessarily mean more enjoyment. So there's this, you know, mythology that the more potent flowers are the most valuable flowers, that the more potent flowers are the most enjoyable, but this data shows that they're not. So, you know, I think about potency from the perspective of an addiction researcher and what we see in all illicit drug markets, whether it is opioids or alcohol, or, you know, in the days of prohibition with cannabis, prohibition promotes potency. And that's because smugglers are trying to pack as much of their stuff into the smallest package possible because they have to move it around. That's where potency comes from. So despite the fact that we have beautiful legal markets and somewhat functional cannabis economies, um, we're still dragging around this legacy, which is completely irrelevant. So you know, I, I think about it, a, a really nice comparison is with moonshine, you know, like, yeah, moonshine is incredibly potent. And, you know, it was easier to move around than other kinds of alcohol, because it had so much alcohol, you know, in, a, in the smallest package possible. Um, but, but we're not in the moonshine days. And when we're as, you know, as a consumer going to a dispensary counter, I could make the moonshine decision, or if I were given the opportunity, if those products existed, I could choose, you know, a nice glass of Cab Sauv or a fine hazy IPA or a farmhouse ale or, you know, a, a barrel aged whiskey. So there's so many other experiences that are possible if we go, if we dip below the intoxication level that moonshine provides us. So I have a couple of questions, but I want to start with the first one with this enjoyment score. Now, does that take in, into account, like uh, when we talked about medical, some of the therapeutic benefits, is that sort of factored into that enjoyment score as well? What sort of no. uh, things look at that? Yeah. So the enjoyment, so we steer very, very clear of any medically relevant questions other than maybe asking about, you know, undesirable side effects, which you, I guess, could argue that a racing heart is a, a you know, um, an adverse outcome. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really trying to see, you know, like what is, what is enjoyable and what's least likely to produce, you know, something undesirable. Um, so no, we're, we're steering clear from medical utility because if you're doing a double blind randomized you know, um, if you're assigning products to people in a double blind randomized fashion and you're asking them medically relevant questions, you're conducting a clinical trial. And currently that is not legal in the United uh, States. Got it. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> I, I, cause it seems like yeah. you could down the road, look at this and say, okay, this particular flower, you know, reduced my pain on a pain scale by this much versus mm -hmm. this other flower. But I, that makes a lot of sense now. So I, yeah. <laughs> I get it. And I'm, yeah. And as a pain researcher, there is absolutely nothing that I would be more delighted to do than ask that very question of these two products, 
which of them made your pain better? You know, that, that is, that's something that myself and my colleagues would, would are longing to be able to do. So if I'm understanding you correctly, basically what I'm hearing is that one, uh, this idea of THC being sort of a marker for evaluating cannabis is something that we should hopefully as a, as a society will stop stop doing and that we need a better tools for evaluating cannabis. And that's sort of what smart cannabis and, and your, your company is looking to accomplish for people is a way for them to better evaluate the effects of these flowers, um, before they, before purchasing based on the amount of available data. Is that, does that sound right? Yes, absolutely. We want to empower the consumer to be able to make choices that promote enjoyment and that are, and we know, at least from this data, that enjoyment and THC don't necessarily go hand in hand. So one of the other really interesting data points from this year, um, and actually we've seen this for a couple years in a row now, is the importance of aroma. So we saw, you know, we have really nice correlations between the aroma of a flower and the effects that are produced by that flower. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if we look at, you know, the, um, the how, how much a person enjoys a particular flower, um, then that is likely to be correlated with how good that flower smells. So the, the better a flower smells, the more likely it is that uh, a consumer is going to enjoy the effect. You know, we also saw a correlation between the aroma and euphoria. So euphoria and enjoyment are, are two different things from our perspective. Euphoria is a mood state. How do you feel emotionally happy? Yes or no. And then the other one is a preference. Do I like this? So, yeah, it kind of makes sense that if you're happy, you're going to like it. But we, we find that that is related to the aroma of the flower. So, you know, in the cultivation community and your, your listeners will probably, this will ring very true to them. There's that old saying, the nose knows. And so, you know, at, at our, at our award ceremony in May, we have the nose knows award for an exemplary cultivar that smells great, that produces a really nice psychological state in our people and makes them happy. Yeah, I want to talk about more of your findings, but I, a question popped in my head while you were talking about this that I was wondering. So along with the challenges of sort of identifying uh, these variables and, and creating this these graphs around these flowers, how do you account for variability among uh, a given cultivar? So like when we talk about like a chemovar expression, something that I know Jeremy Plum is really passionate about and, talk, and go, dives into, do you see this becoming like the wine industry where the 2017 OG Kush that was grown outdoors on this farm was sort of that, you know, created this one experience and then next year it may be a, a different experience altogether because they may have changed something in the soil profile. It might've received more water and mm -hmm. more sunlight, you know, all of these different variables. Right. You're absolutely right. And, and this is a tricky question, which I think will, A, we're working on it. And B, it will take some time to, to really fully develop and it'll need some consensus among the community. Because, you know, from my perspective, like the most conservative thing is to say that you always have a novel cultivar. No matter if you put the same, you know, name on it or not, you know, it is even under very tightly controlled growing conditions, you know, artificial intelligence controlled greenhouse stuff like you know even under those tightly controlled conditions with genetics that are identical harvest to harvest we have genetic drift you know we have environmental changes that very profoundly affect phytochemistry and so from my perspective every single time we produce a certificate of analysis for a cultivar it's a unique thing it's a it's a totally new thing every single time so i don't think you know, unlike wine, I think it'll be much more difficult to, you know, routinely produce the exact same chemistry time after time after time. Um, I think that we're getting closer to that. And I do think that, you know, Jeremy is a prime example of, you know, the, the level of rigor it takes to get those harvest to harvest really, really reproducible outcomes. 
Um, but I'm, again, like, I'm okay with this. You know, this is the world we live in. We have a lot of variability in this plant because it is crazy sensitive to its environment. So if that's the case, then great. But I do think that there is work to be done in creating rough categories of chemovars. Um, so that is, you know, we have our types one, two, and three, our THC dominant and then hemp-like, you know, flowers. Um, and then within those, we, there probably is some further, you know, chemo taxonomy that's related to the terpene expression. But even, you know, we're, we're looking at hops and we're looking at other, you know, um, agricultural products. And we know that a lot of the aroma from hops doesn't necessarily come from terpenes. It comes from other molecules that don't currently appear on anyone's certificate of analysis. Oh. They're totally not on the radar. Um, so, you know, this, this is, this is something that, you know, I, I think that it's going to be, this is what's the most exciting thing to me about cannabis is that it's like the Mariana trench, both in terms of the chemicals it produces, as well as what those chemicals do in the people that are consuming the plant. Um, so we have a, many, many decades of discovery ahead of us, but, um, but yeah, I, I, we're currently working on a project. We're using this data set from the cultivation classic, um, in partnership with some colleagues in California to see like, okay, if we can model different chemotypes, you know, what kinds of buckets of cannabis are there? And then can we pr create a predictive model, which will then, you know, fit these new, um, you know, um, cultivars that are coming out and put those into those different, you know, chemo taxonomic buckets. That's, that's really interesting. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned smell and we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. terpenes and I know you have some terpene data. And one of the things that I learned, I wasn't aware of was that, you know, cannabis for a long time was mercine dominant primarily. And now mm -hmm. we're starting over the last few years, we're seeing more variability in that. Can you talk a little bit about what you're, what you're seeing in terms of the variability now in terpenes and what effects people are reporting related to that data? Yeah, for sure. You know, the effects thing is tricky because our data set would tell us that the mindset of the person is the most predictive thing. The mindset and the aroma are the most predictive things. So if this person expects it to have an indica-like response, then it's that's what it's going to do for them, which is not that surprising if we look at cannabis, essentially, or THC being a mild classic psychedelic. And if you look at all the other classic psychedelic drugs, the mindset prior to ingesting the drug is a huge component in the ultimate outcome. So if you have an expectation that this product is going to do this for you, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, with, with the data that we currently have, it's not sufficiently large enough to, to detect these patterns. Um, not to mention the fact that, you know, we're, we're not just looking at the effect of myrcene. We're looking at the effect of myrcene in combination with all of this other huge host of chemicals that, you know, polypharmacy is a completely different ball game than, you know, just taking myrcene on its own. Um, so, you know, if, if we look at what we've seen in the data this year compared to last year, one of the things that's unfortunate is that, um, you know, we see a lot of plants that tend to be more similar to one another compared to, you know, a, a different from one another. Um, and we would really like to see all the freaks we would love for people to submit flowers that are very unique and very special. Um, but what we have seen is that, you know, compared to last year, we have way more terpenoline dominant cultivars. So, you know, this, this is, you know, for some of the old school folks out there, um, Dutch treat, the smell of Dutch treat, that's a terpenoline dominant aroma. This tends to be also a very potent aroma, intense. So, you know, like a lot of people can detect, oh, I i don't know, you know, a lot of different types of weed from one another, but I can smell terpenaline. Um, it's a very distinct aroma. Same thing with citrus. Something has a citrus aroma that tends to be really distinct in people's minds. And, you know, like five out of seven judges can easily detect a citrus aroma. You know, they don't have to be trained in sensory evaluation to go, yep, this smells like citrus. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I, and I think that that speaks to, you know, trends, you know, just like perfume, if we have 
you know, a number of years ago, sandalwood was really popular. And there are all these perfumes on the market that smelled like sandalwood. And then oud was really popular. Oud oil was very popular. And so many perfumes out there that had oud as their, you know, primary aroma. And so, you know, I, I can suspect that if we allow the market to be driven by the sensory experience of cannabis, that we would see very similar trends, that things would wax and wane over time. Um, terpinolin might, you know, terpinolin might have been hot this year, but maybe next year we'll have pinene dominant, you know, cultivars as our front runners. Who knows? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So you also found research around gender too, if that, if, if that's right, what I remember from the presentation with Steph, um, do well, you want to touch on that yes or no? Yeah. I mean, so gender is a social construct and specifically the question uh. we asked was biological sex. And the reason we ask the question that way is because we know from the scientific literature that cannabis affects biological males and biological females differently. You know, there are different rates of the development of tolerance to THC. There are different effects on our hormonal systems. So it was important for us to see, you know, can we actually detect a sex difference? And are there kinds of cannabis that are biologically better suited for men and women? or biological men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we were able to, you know, use all of the data to find, you know, a cultivar, you know, we, we found cultivars that were liked equally amongst men and women. These are like outstanding flowers that won for whatever other reason that they won. Um, but we were able to find, you know, one standout flower that produced a really nice effect and a very desirable aroma for women. But the men were kind of like, meh. So, hmm, so that's, that's um, that's one that we, we, uh, we deemed that one, that was the ladies choice award. So, um, that, that was, that's a beautiful flower and it just so happens to be my, my personal favorite as well. It's a, it's a type two with, you know, roughly 6% THC. It's a lovely, lovely cultivar. Thank you for correcting me on the biological versus, uh, gender differences. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I, it's important to highlight that. And I, I realized the way that came across. So, um, yeah, that's, that, I think that's important. And uh, personally for myself, uh, the, the one flower that I really enjoyed happened to be a type two flower called Kava that was grown by up here by a company called Goldleaf. So um, I, I yeah, think man, that that's these really type interesting. Twos, yeah, the type twos have very, uh, I, I think that this is where we have a lot of promise in the future of the industry is with these type twos, you know, like, like you were saying, your personal experience with cannabis is that, yeah, like you might feel sleepy, but your mind is going crazy. And to me, that's very indicative of, a, frankly, a THC overdose. Hmm. So what what's possible below that threshold of intoxication? So if you, you know, there's two ways you can do that. You can slowly dial back from 20, 20 and 30% flowers and see what you feel. Or you could work your way up from hemp, you know, starting with a heady hemp product. And then, you know, especially for a new consumer who has no tolerance, um, you know, the, the easiest way to not have a bad time is to not consume t too much THC. Um, so, so yeah, this is where I think those type two flowers are really valuable because one, they're balanced with CBD, which is, you know, experimentally been shown to reduce the paranoia and anxiety that's produced by THC. So if you're consuming them in roughly equal amounts, great, you're protecting yourself from that paranoia to begin with. You've got enough THC on board to get yourself into the therapeutic window. What I mean by that is that if we look in medicine, every drug has a therapeutic window where you have to take a certain dose where the patient feels it. But if you take too high of a dose, then negative side effects start to happen. And this is exactly the same with THC. But if you take it out of the context of medicine and just look at enjoyment, you got to get up into the therapeutic window so that you can feel it. But you can't take so much that now you have racing thoughts, racing heart, dry eyes, dry mouth, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, these type two flowers have an immense potential to have wide appeal across many different kinds of people for many different kinds of purposes because they're just less risky. I, I like that. And that fits with me. One of the things uh, Jeff Lowenfeld said, he was asked, you know, what's the most potent flower you've ever tried and things like that. And 
all these questions. And, and basically what he, what he said around it, which I thought was a good point was like, Hey, we don't need to go stronger and stronger. Like that's, that, that's not the, that's not the solution. Like you can always, you know, take another hit, you know, you can always have a mm-hmm. little bit more. Let's stop trying to get this, you know, like you said, like these 25, 30% THC dominant, uh, flowers. And, uh, yeah, it sounds like your research is sort of supporting that concept. So you actually have some data to support that now. And I guess what I'm wondering is how, how does this impact growers? So let, let's talk a little bit about that. So as a grower, how can I use this information to better, you know, cultivate and sell my product? Man, this, I love this question so much and thank you for asking it. I want to start the answer with an anecdote. So One of our um, judges is also a cultivator in the cultivation classic. So, and, and he's been involved in this process since the very beginning. He's always submitted flower. And I think he's always been a judge. He might've missed a year. Um, But in, in one of his early years, you know, we gave him his feedback. We revealed at the end, Hey, these were all the flowers that you liked the best. And he was shocked to find that some of his most favorable responses were to flowers that had a really high CBD content. And he was kind of bummed because he had absolutely zero CBD in his garden. So what did he do? He went back and he introduced some CBD and some more balanced phytochemistry into his garden. And, you know, their business is doing really great. And he's got wonderful, wonderful products on the market. But it's not all that surprising. So if you ask these cultivators, like, what is your what is your most treasured flower that you're producing? A lot of them will say, oh, man, I've got this purple girl who's like 14 to 17 percent THC. She smells like, you know, Flintstone vitamins. And it's just the most beautiful thing. Best experience. It's transcendental. I can't sell it because it's less than 20 percent THC. So the cultivators already know this. And the consumers, if, they're, if they ever have an opportunity to try a moderate, you know, potency flower, they often will also say, yeah, I can only take one hit. Or wouldn't it be nice if I could take two hits? Like, you know, because I really enjoy it. I like the taste of it. I like the experience. But, you know, I, those potent flowers, just it's not fun for me. So the customer often knows it. Sometimes they don't. You know, there's still a ton of THC hunting out there. But the customer, you know, is, is starting to realize that, you know, potency is not necessarily the best. So the cultivator knows it and the consumer sometimes knows it, but there's a really critical sort of um, choke point at the intake level, at, at retail intake. So I've talked to retail intake managers in Washington who literally tell me, my boss won't let me buy any flower that has less than 17% THC those flowers have literally been cut out of the market. So those ones that fit so beautifully in the therapeutic window that are so wonderfully produced in the full sun with a rich terpene profile and moderate potency, those flowers that are the most enjoyable are ironically the ones that are least likely to be found on the dispensary shelf. It's a real shame. Yeah, I think it's a big problem. So how do we address that as a society? Um, how do we educate consumers to select yeah. for flowers that are you know, going to be more enjoyable for them over time? How do we move away from this sort of THC dominant uh, thought process? Yeah, I, I think that it requires, this is a, a big problem that doesn't have one solution. I think we need to address the problem from multiple angles. You know, we clearly need widespread PSA level information like, hey, you're too high on a billboard. Um, But we also need, you know, bud tenders and and, and intake managers who have the education as well to be able to pass on that knowledge directly at the counter, where when they have a consumer who comes in and says, what's the most THC I can get, you know, for my $6 a gram? Then the bud tender can say, well, you, you could take that moonshine route. And why don't you also try this other thing? Because, you know, like, yeah, that'll get you messed up. But we have this other thing which might actually be more enjoyable. So I, I think that it is, you know, a multimodal approach. We need to have bud tenders who really 
not only, you know, get this information, but they experience it for themselves. Um, you know, the intake managers are open to producing higher values, monetary values um, for type two flowers and flowers with moderate potency. And of course, you know, like a, a widespread, you know, public education campaign about, you know, like THC ain't all it's cracked up to be. I, I totally agree. I hope I hope you're right. I, my concern is, as a, from a growing perspective, as a cultivator, you know, it's risky to try and cultivate a flower that's under seventeen percent that may not sell sell on the on the shelf. Is it possible to use this data as a consumer facing uh, approach to where this could be near the flower or out by the flower, so people can say, "Hey, we're seeing these responses on this flower. Um, give it a try." Yes. Absolutely. And that's one of the huge benefits from our process is that we're able to take this data and feed it back to the cultivator and feed it back to the consumer. So our judges at the end, you know, they get access to all of their, you know, we unblind them and tell them what they like the best. And they go, wow, I had no idea. Just like, you know, that cultivator anecdote that I told you earlier. Um, so yeah, I would love to, to see that deployed at a larger scale level. And we have some projects that we're working on that are moving toward that. Um, you know, really enabling the consumer to have a, a personalized experience um, that, you know, is is based on their own um, experience with different cultivars of cannabis. Um, and, and, yeah, you're absolutely right that this is a risk. Like, you have to uh, – all of the, the, you know, decisions at wholesale and retail level are currently being made on historical data, right? We're looking backward to see what sold last quarter and the quarter before that and the quarter before that. And that's where we're, we're assuming that the future is 100% dependent upon the past. When really what we need is to not ask, you know, what do people think they wanna buy? But really, what do people actually need? So it's less looking backward to see what sold previously and more looking forward about what people will be buying in the future because it's a, a more enjoyable experience. And that's precisely what this, what this project is aimed at doing. Yeah. So what do you see for the future of this industry? I know we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but was there anything else you wanted to add to that in terms of uh, what you're seeing or, or how you, what direction you see us going? For sure. You know, I, I think that what we have learned from other agricultural products is that, you know, as things happen with corporate consolidation, there's this trend toward monocropping and producing an agricultural product for yield. And producing a product for yield at scale is like the entirely opposite thing that our data reveals, which is that these, you know, craft types of artisan flowers are the ones that tend to be the most diverse in terpenes, the most interesting and, um, and desirable smelling, and the ones that produce the most um, enjoyable experiences. So, you know, I would hope that this industry would take an evidence-based approach as well as a practical one in that we need to have sustainable products that aren't, you know, pulling resources out of this earth. Um, and we need to be putting products into our bodies that don't burn out our endocannabinoid systems and put us at risk for cannabis use disorder and hyperemesis and all the other health risks that are associated with potent THC products. I completely understand where, how we got to the place we are where everyone is trying to push their certificates of analysis up to that 30% mark. But the reality is that when you give people a chance to consume cannabis in a blinded fashion. That's just not what they want. So I think it's going to take some growing pains and I think it's going to take some leaps of faith. Um, it's going to take, you know, a small part of the garden dedicated to, you know, a nice moderate potency flower and just kind of cross your fingers and see what happens with that guy. Um, but I think that there is a moderate path here. You know, I don't think it makes sense to completely just like flip the market overnight where all of a sudden, you know, nobody's growing 25% flowers anymore. But the slow introduction of, you know, more diverse products is wise because we have more diverse people 
than ever before, using cannabis for more diverse reasons than ever before. So, you know, it, if you think about your 4th of July barbecue, you know, you've got kids in the pool and the barbecue's on and every adult in the yard is standing there with a beer in their hand. And at any point, something happens with one of the kids in the pool, you know, any adult can drop the beer, put the kid in the car and get to the emergency room. But what is the equivalent of cannabis? Right. What 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 kind of cannabis is the I, I can still drive and I can take my kids to the emergency room kind of cannabis? What is the, you know, Sunday afternoon hike? What is the 6 a.m. yoga before I have to go to work and be at my desk at 9 a.m.? You know, there there are lots of different kinds of people using cannabis for more reasons than ever before. And it would make sense to produce lots of diverse products, which would fit all of those diverse needs. Yeah, one question I forgot to ask you that I was thinking of is, did you see any difference between outdoor versus indoor grown flour on these scales? Or is that something you tracked? And then I know you haven't looked at organic versus conventionally grown cannabis, but is that on the radar at all either? No, honestly, we don't really have any interest in looking at conventionally grown cannabis because we believe that organically grown cannabis is the right thing to do. We believe that, you know, this is better for the earth. It's better for the humans. So I I don't foresee that we're going to be looking at conventionally grown cannabis. Um, We have definitely looked at light type. And if I go back to those, um, the, the top 10 um, you know, the, the most enjoyable to least enjoyable, I believe the majority of those were cultivated with supplemental light. So the way that we ask the question is, you know, like this could be any supplemental light. So it could be in a greenhouse um, with, with some light. Um, but, you know, with a greenhouse, we also, or a hoop house, you often still get the full spectrum that, you know, a sun only um, flower would get. So that's how, that's how we um, different things. But yeah, I mean, people like both indoor and outdoor ones, um, you know, equally, it seems. I can tell you from a phytochemical level, we, we see the most diverse, you know, we tend to see the, the widest array of terpenes um, expressed by, you know, flowers that are produced in the sun. That makes, that makes sense. I could, I could see that. Um just based on the spectrum mm-hmm. and the analysis. Uh, you, you mentioned cannabis, and I'm going to mispronounce it, hy- hyperments. How do, you, how do you say that word? Yeah, hyperemesis. Hyperemesis. Have you seen any research to support mm-hmm. what is causing this? I've heard people uh, correlate it supposedly with azadiractin and neem and a variety of other things. I've heard people blame it on, um, Oh, I, I can't remember. There were there were a variety of things and theories. Have you seen any actual research yeah. on this? Yeah, this is a very active field, and I can tell you 100%. It comes from overstimulating the endogenous cannabinoid system with cannabinoids. It is not related to toxins. It's not related to pesticides. It's not a side effect of neem. You know that that theory, you know, kind of went viral, and it was very um, widely adopted for a long time. But, you know, in looking at, you know, both zooming in to the receptors where cannabinoids bind, you know, at the molecular level, as well as everything that's, you know, reported by physicians in the emergency departments who are treating these people who have hyperemesis, all of the evidence is pointing toward this is a cannabinoid mediated effect interacting with the endogenous cannabinoid system. So it seems to be causing people that are extremely heavy users. Um, is it something that it, it builds up over time and then they, it can hit at any point or is there, are there things that are triggering it for certain users? Is it, it's not cultivar specific or, or related in any way or anything like that? You know, I, I, these are all excellent questions that I think we have some evidence to support that, yes, you're absolutely right. This, this tends to happen in heavy users, you know, people who use very frequently for very long periods of time. Um, we don't know exactly which molecules may be contributing or, or that is, you know, which chemobars or cultivars of cannabis are contributing to this effect. But, you know, it, it makes sense. It makes sense that a lot of these heavy users are using very potent products, and it's very, very likely 
that it is a THC mediated effect um, and, you know, wh what, how you could balance that risk with, you know, a more diverse cultivar, a type two cultivar that had more CBD, totally unknown at this point. And frankly, it's going to be a long time before we understand that because we need the federal guidelines to, you know, turn around so that we can do that kind of research and, and collect that data, um, you know, in a controlled manner. Great. Well, I'm glad we got to touch on that too, because it's something that's been in the back of my brain for a while. So it's good to hear some real information on that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and, and sharing a lot of this because uh, I think that, I hope this is the direction of cannabis consumption in the future. And I think we need these science-based tools to really make informed decisions. I know here in Washington, we're not allowed to even smell the flower. So you really don't even know. Mm -hmm. we, we can't make that correlation between smell and enjoyment, like you mentioned. So um, yeah, was there anything else you wanted to share with listeners before, uh, before I let you go for the day? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I, you know, briefly, I think that what you've just mentioned is a huge problem for consumers. You know, here we have data telling us that this is the most important indicator of an enjoyable experience, an aroma. And yet you're completely depriving the consumer of the ability to make an informed decision. And you're forcing them to make a decision based on potency, which we know is bad because potency promotes all of the health risks. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would love if your regulators in, in Washington and in California and in all of those other markets where, you know, consumers aren't allowed to smell the product, you know, we need to be able to pass this information on and say, hey, like this is a really important biological decision making factor that it's not fair to deprive the consumers of. I mean, I would agree with that. It wouldn't be the first time regulation uh, got in the way of uh, things that made sense. Uh, right. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned odor and odor is another, a whole nother topic, I feel like, because it is so complex. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned that there are even terpenes that we aren't even measuring at this point, potentially, or understanding, like with your allusion to hops. Um, yeah. And, and not even necessarily terpenes. You know, there are other aromatic compounds that produce aromas that are not terpenes. You know, so we have aldehydes and ketones and other molecules that are present in hops and in grapes and in roses and in cannabis. You know, we have those other molecules that produce aromas that are not terpenes or terpenoids. And nobody is nobody's looking for those. <laughs> so. Um, and you're absolutely right that, you know, the sensory component is a whole other, you know, 60 minute episode in and of itself, you know, like what smells are there and in what intensity and who can, who can differentiate between them and who is sensitive to these smells and who isn't and what is, what is that more rigorous, um, uh, relationship between the aroma and the experience. This is, yeah, it's a huge area of opportunity for exploration. Well, I'm super grateful to have you on the show. Uh, I really appreciate your time today and, uh, I hope maybe I can get you guys back on as more research, you know, comes out in what you guys are studying and, uh, we'll go from there. So thank you. Yeah, that sounds great, Tad. We've got a lot more projects planned for 2020, so it would be a pleasure to come back and share our updated findings. And uh, yeah, I will see you guys at the Cultivation Classic. At the very least, I, I plan on attending. Have we? Have you set a date for uh, 2020 yet? Yeah, it's the last weekend in May, so it's after Memorial Day. Okay, and people can go to cultivationclassic.cc to check out that website. I'm going to put all the information relating to this website and maybe even some of the data, if you're open to sharing it, um, I, I can put that on the website podcast page too. Awesome. That sounds great, Tad. All right. Well, thanks. I will uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Take care. That was Dr. A.D. Ray, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget to check out our website at www.kisorganics.com for more information and resources and links to topics we discussed on the show today. And while you're there, please sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage so you can stay up to date and give us a follow on Instagram at kisorganics. Thanks for listening. <laughs>